Hey everyone, we are live. If you guys could type in, if you can hear me, just type the word yes into the chat box. I'd appreciate that. I'm using a different headset than I normally use and I wanna make sure that you guys can hear me. Uh, my name is Andrew Krause. I'm the co-founder of InventRight. Uh, Stephen Key and myself co-founded InventRight 20 plus years ago, really, really long time ago. And we've had students in over 65 countries. And yeah, some of those are like, I got a, had a student on a French Polynesian island that had a thousand people um, on it and then all sorts of other places. But it still sounds pretty damn cool to say you've had students in over 65 countries. Um, and I'm very proud of that because you can do licensing from absolutely anywhere. You could do it from the beach with your laptop. You could do it at your home office. You could do it in your car. You could do it anywhere. Um, as long as you have an internet connection and you and some sort of work ethic, you can do this. And of course, your creativity. Um, so I'm just rambling for a little bit as some of the questions come in. Um, I think it's the new time. We've been doing this on Wednesdays usually, and I'm changing to Mondays um, at 4 Pacific. Um, probably won't be doing this forever, but I don't really have a date where we're going to stop doing this because I'm having a lot of fun. And you guys have absolutely fantastic questions. So um, let's go ahead and get going here as more people file in. And so go ahead. If you got some questions, type them into the, the, uh, the chat box. All right. Uh, Perm B says, oh, and at the beginning of your question, type your first name so I can address you by your first name, especially if your handle isn't your name, um, because people have these really weird handles. And it's nice to, to address you by your name. So uh, Perm B says, hi, everyone. Hope everyone is having success. I hope so as well. And, you know, I, I wanted to kind of define success a little bit. Success with licensing isn't just standing at the top of the mountain going, I'm making all this money with my licensing deal. It's also all the success that you had along the way, the success with learning the process. So if you never thought you could call companies and have them say yes to your sell sheet, maybe show interest and talk with them. And maybe that particular deal fell off the table. But that is success too, because it's success with understanding and becoming empowered with how to license. So you can license products the rest of your life. So um, there are a lot of different kinds of success. It's not just seeing your product in the store. Of course, that's the goal. Um, but being successful with learning the process so you can keep licensing products the rest of your life, that's an incredibly important form of success as well. Um, so Saeed, who I got to meet the other day, really, really cool guy. And I think Javad was his partner. Really smart couple, couple engineers, guys. I really enjoyed meeting with you. Um, and Saeed wrote, uh, hi, Andrew, what should I do if Disney characters are, oh, well, I should say Saeed is now a student of ours as well as uh, Javad, his partner. Um, Hi, Andrew, what should I do if Disney characters are part of my invention? Thanks. So, you know, you have to take a look at your invention and if you wanna make Disney characters part of it, realize that some of the potential licensees, the companies you reach out to may regularly put Disney or other characters um, on the products and others don't, they keep it more generic. So they might put some cute, characters that kids might like, but it's kind of generic and it's just kid friendly um, characters or colors or designs. And then other ones will do what's called brand licensing and they'll pay Disney a royalty in order to put uh, the Disney characters on their products. So a lot of times when you're licensing to a company with, a, you think it's Disney and it's not, it's a Disney licensee. So they're making a product and they're paying Disney to put Mickey Mouse or um, my eight-year-old daughter is really in the descendants right now is the latest thing for girls and maybe boys too, mostly girls. Um, and to put those characters on their um, stuff. My daughter just had a birthday and she got an outfit with one of the descendants girls. Thing. She has balloons with descendants, she has everything. So let's say it's the company making the balloons with the Disney descendants characters on it. Disney isn't making that balloon more than likely. It's a balloon company making it and they're paying Disney a royalty to put the characters on there. So um, realize that if you wanna license something with Disney on it, you know, you quite often when you make a sell sheet, you don't wanna be so focused on only that. So you might have a generic version, 
So it's the product with some nice kid-friendly design on it. And then it's also, you show, you know, many branding possibilities available and you show a version with Disney on it. So you can reverse them. You can make the generic, the prominent picture and the brand licensing like Disney, a uh, more minor thing, or you can make the brand licensing the major thing and the more minor thing being the generic that doesn't have the Disney on it or whatever other characters. So the reason why it's really important is you don't want to show only brand licensed characters when some of the companies you're approaching do don't do that. So they're like, oh, well, we don't do that. Do you have those characters? So if you make a sell sheet that, uh, that appeals to both, then you can address both and you're not going to alienate the people that do generic stuff. And you're not going to, I mean, it's not generic. It just doesn't have characters on it. And you're still going to attract the people with the brand licensing. So, Saeed, the thing that I would recognize is to have both of those options on there. Um, everybody wants to put Disney on their product, of course, or any other, or NFL or NBA or whatever else. Um, recognize that a lot of the companies you're going to license to are not going to be Disney. They're going to be companies that license the characters from Disney. And it's really simple. I mean, if they're selling products <coughs> in the stores with those Disney characters, you know they're already set up. So they're manufacturing. Let's say you have a balloon innovation site. They're manufacturing balloons, and they already have some Disney characters on there. So now they're set up to do that. Now, other companies, when you look at their product line, they have nice characters on there, kind of generic characters or cute colors that appeal to kids, for example. But there, you don't see any Disney, you don't see cars, you don't see NFL, you don't see any of that other stuff. They're probably not going to do something really different than what they're already doing. Now, by putting them both on there, you can entertain that thought. But companies that do brand licensing do brand licensing. Ones that don't, don't. Try to convince the company that they should do it. You're both trying to convince them to buy your invention and do brand licensing, which they're not familiar with. Okay. Um, you guys can all hear me okay. Type just a quick yes. I know one person already typed yes because it's a new headset for me and I'm just using this portion of it. Um, it's not a new one. It's just a new one that I've never used on YouTube. Um, let, it's a cool name, Latonia. Let, Latonia, Latonia, cool. Um, hi, Andrew, what are the top five phrases to use in a provisional patent to cover the invention and innovation? I couldn't really cover that. Um, but I, I could say, I could, I could give you kind of an example of one mistake that people make. You don't want to say, and this is not how you'd word it. I'm just exaggerating to make a point. You don't say, this is not what this is. But you don't want to say it's a, it's a pencil exactly four millimeters in diameter with pink and purple dots on it. It's so specific. It's covering nothing. If people make it three millimeters in diameter, and they make it with different color dots, which color dots are not patentable. It's just a silly example. It's very easy to get around it. So, you know, in, in, when you're writing a, a provisional patent, you want to be, you can be narrow, but you want to broaden it out. You don't want to limit yourself. It's so specific. It's just this. You're going to mess yourself up when you write a provisional patent doing that. So you say it could be this or this or this or this. And one way of wording it is, but not limited to these methods. Or, but not limited to this attachment mechanism, but not limited to. So if you're going to be specific in parts of your provisional patent, use wording that says but not limited to. Our software will, will helps with this sort of thing, our smart IP software. So even though I thought I couldn't answer your question, you know, I kind of, that was a helpful tip that I'll give you. Um, would you speak to the license? You, you got a whole bunch of questions in here. You're sneaky. You put it all as one, huh? What do you speak? I'm just joking. What would you speak to the specifics of keeping IP? Does that include having a copyright, trademark, and PPA? So, for those of you who are new, intellectual property, and you can use the word intellectual property when you're talking to companies so you can sound smart, right? Intellectual property just means copyrights, trademarks, patents, and also um, uh, trade secrets. Trade secrets is like, coca-cola formula like we're not going to pat it, we're not going to show it to anybody and but if somebody figured it out they could still do it so it's just a secret it's very hard to do it keep a trade secret but for the most part intellectual property for you guys is going to mean copyrights trademarks and patents 
So that's a little bit of advice, but I still don't understand your question. Would you speak to the specifics of keeping intellectual property? So I'm going to give you my own answer, and I think it might answer what you're asking, is most of our students, they, they don't file a trademark. A trademark is like Coca-Cola or Disney or um, different, different, you know, marks, like InventRight right here is a, is a trademark. So, um, you know, you don't know if they're interested and a good percentage of the time they're going to want to name it something else. So for you to go out and spend a ton of money with a trademark attorney to get a trademark doesn't really make a lot of sense. Again, everything I share tonight is not legal advice. Seek the services of an attorney before you move forward on anything. So these are just business deal points and thoughts. These are, this is not legal advice. Um, so, you know, most of our students, they just put the, the TM. And like I've said in prior meetings before, we actually have a registered trademark now, but we've been around 20 years. And it was only last year that we actually filed the trademark because we use it. If anybody did anything to do with inventing or um, coaching inventors and they use the word invent right, they would be hosed. We have 20 years of proof. And that's called a, that's a good common law trademark. That's the TM and it's free. So you can just stick stuff. You can stick TM on your sell sheet with your name and it's putting people on notice you intend on using it. Now, with a trademark, it's not, it's technically, it's kind of like a provisional patent for the lack of a better term. I'm not saying it is, I'm just saying it's a temporary placeholder. So you can, you can if you later file a registered trademark, then um, it's just additional documentation. But you, with trademarks, it's different. You could never file a registered trademark, just do the TM like we have up on this banner because we're not updating it not update the whole banner just because of that. Um, and you cannot uh, necessarily keep the mark unless you use it in commerce. Now we're using invent right in commerce, but what, it, what a TM is doing is it's putting people on notice, but you can't not use a mark for five years and say, well, I put TM on it, so I'm protected. You, you have to register it. And even if you register it, it won't give you that protection unless you continue to use it in commerce and across state lines even, you know? So if you want protection everywhere. So, um, you know, so that's trademark guys. So my point is, sorry for going such a long tangent here. My point is our students will typically put a TM on their name. It doesn't cost you a dime and it looks professional. And it doesn't cost you anything. In some instances, you might wanna go out and register the mark, but see if they're interested in it first, okay? And again, that's not legal advice. The services of an attorney if you're seeking legal advice. Um, and then as far as copyrights, that's automatic too. You put a little C and you copyright, you know, your whole sell sheet, any instructions you have and any wording and such. But most of the protection that you're going to get is with a provisional patent application. And you'll file a provisional patent application. And it's going to give you one year to see if there's any interest. It allows you to say, you don't have to even say provisional patent pending. You can say patent pending. You can legally say patent pending on your marketing materials, see if there's interest. And that's why we advise our students to file that like the day before you're ready to start calling. People get the warm and fuzzies that they're protected, that they have a provisional patent. Um, and that's great, but it does you no good if you don't know how to reach out to companies. And if you file it the week before you're ready to start calling, you got a whole year. You never need a year using the invent right approach. Now I have no plenty of inventors, tons that will file a provisional and then just sit on their hands because they don't know how to, and that's not a criticism, they don't know how to reach out to companies. You know, fair enough. Um, and if you have any public disclosures, you can file that same provisional again. You can take the exact same thing, spend another 70 bucks. But if you're not going to do anything and you're not going to reach out to companies, why keep behind the scenes filing these provisionals over and over and over again? What's the point? You know, you'll lose your original date. Each new date is from, they don't continue with each other, is from the date you filed the new provisional. I hate talking about that because it's, I don't hate talking about it. I just feel like I've said it a million times, but I know there's a ton of you out there that haven't heard it and it's very empowering. Um, so, you know, but it's just like, whenever you get into patents, it's like, you got to, oh, you explain it here. Oh, but then somebody could misinterpret it over here. And then you all oh, got to explain that and that and that. And then 30 minutes later, you're like, oh, damn, let's get back to the fun stuff. But um, so hopefully, uh, La Latonia, um, that's uh, hopefully that was helpful. Um, Mike says, my new idea has seven components. What if the company doesn't like the idea as a whole, 
but does like one of the components. Okay, well, I don't know what you mean by components, but that's great. I mean, um, maybe they want to license one of those. But, you know, when you're making your marketing presentation, um, you're making the marketing presentation as a whole. Um, and you're going to hopefully get into a discussion with the company if they're showing some interest. Um, and you can have that discussion and you can adjust. This is what a lot of inventors don't understand is a lot of inventing is done after you talk to the company. And they say, well, we really like this, oh, but we're concerned about this. Oh, well, let me think on that. And you get, let me get back to you next week. And you think on something, and then you get back to them next week, and you got this slightly different version. That's a big part of inventing. So, Mike, um, be willing to adjust. Um, ask for feedback. A lot of inventors don't. That's a giant mistake. And maybe based on that feedback, you might tweak a component or tweak what your invention is to make them more satisfied with it. Absolutely. So, um, but you can't pitch five versions of your idea. That's a no-no. You got to pick the best version and just show it to them. Um, but that's not what you were talking about. You were talking about a component. So, um, yeah, ask for feedback and be willing to adjust. And most inventors think like, oh, what, really? I need to do that? Yeah, you, you, that's a great thing to do. Um, Uh, why do we keep getting this question? It's a good question, though, Josh. Some people say that I need an LLC to license my idea. What, why, why do inventors need them? I've talked extensively about this pretty much every call, but I'll, I'll just say it limits your liability. So when you do a licensing deal, you could wait until you do the deal. The company doesn't care if you use your personal email and use a different name. And if you're in the midst of a deal and say, hey, I want to do one of this new LLC, um, then they'll say, okay. So it limits your liability, Josh. So you're going to insist that they have product liability insurance and that you're covered under it. Um, somebody sues them, they're going to sue you. They're going to sue, sorry, sue them, not you, because they're the ones with the deep pockets, not you. Also, most uh, consumers, they wouldn't even know you existed. They're not putting your face of the inventor on the package 99 times out of 100. So they wouldn't even know you existed. And they could look up a patent and maybe see it. But again, they're going to sue the company. But on top of all that, if you also have an LLC, that's additional measure of protection. If you take your royalties out and you empty it out every three months when they pay your royalties, you've got very, very low liability if you combine all those things. So that's why it's a good idea to file an LLC. To me, it's just one more thing to do um, while you're trying to learn all this licensing stuff. So you could do it when you're in the midst of a deal, when you're about to close a deal. Um, but that is your decision, you know, that you need to make. Um, Joseph, some companies have idea submission pages that are really a disclaimer. They don't have a submit form. They say, we do not accept unsolicited ideas. Your ideas will become our property. Yeah, so what's your question, Joseph? Oh, okay, here, you continue it here. We have no obligation to keep your idea confidential. Should I steer clear of these companies or does this just mean I have to get permission before submitting ideas? Well, that's a good question. That's a good expansion of it. Um, you know, it depends on how it's written. Um, if it's written, if it's saying we don't want your ideas, but they, they might just say we don't want to take unsolicited ideas, but it says you need to get first get permission. Um, so you need to get permission then. But if it says we don't, we're, we're not interested, anything you submit will become our, it, it's, it's a little bit threatening. So you have to, it's going to depend on exactly how it's written. Um, I think a lot of times if they're saying we do not accept unsolicited ideas, anything you submit will become our property um, that I think is pretty much saying they're not interested. But if you're like, oh, but I really like them, just say, you know, copy what it says on the site and say it says this on your site. If I get permission, is it OK? And then submit to a marketing manager or call the operator and ask. Just call and ask, you know. Um, sometimes our students will say, like this and this and this happened. And Andrew, what do you think they're thinking? And I'm like, I don't know. Why don't you ask them? <laughs> you know, I think a lot of times we just want to, once you do this a lot, you get used to actually reaching out and talking to companies and it's no big deal. It's an email. It's a LinkedIn message. It's calling the operator and asking. Um, and, you know, maybe she doesn't have the answer, but she'll guide you to somebody that does. Oh, I'll get the answer for you. Or why don't you email Joe? He'll, he'll tell you. 
Um, so I think in some cases, Joseph, it might not mean that they don't want to receive your ideas. It might just be like, we don't want to get them unsolicited. Um, we, we need to get our permission first. So, um, okay, this is a good one. Gabriel, hi, Andrew. I'm confused about building relationships and reaching out to companies. How do you build relationships online? Um, sorry, guys, I need to eat, drink something here. How do you... How do you build relationships online? From what I understand, we are just cold calling them, right? Okay, that's a good question. So, Gabriel, you're building relationships. That you're essentially building the relationship by submitting your first product. So by submitting them your first product, it's an opportunity for them to say no. And then for you to say, oh, no problem. Are you open to more? And they're like, oh, yeah, sure. Now you have a relationship. <laughs> you sent something. It wasn't so batshit whatever crazy that I wasn't supposed to say that swear word. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I was trying to say an alternate and then I, anyway. Um, so it wasn't so crazy that they're like, Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. You can send us more. Just email me. And you ask them what the process is. So you're, but you're going to build a relationship. No, you're not just going to cold call. You're also going to reach out on LinkedIn. You should really do both. You should call them. They should reach out on LinkedIn, but by you're not like oh I'm calling you I want to build a relationship you know you're just by submitting them to your first product um, but I mean by asking them what their process is and you know and you don't have to be ready to send yet that's one thing that a lot of people misunderstand you can send out somebody on LinkedIn what's your process would you be the right person even though you know they're the right person would you be the right person to submit to or somebody else you don't have to be ready to send you can do that sort of thing and it could be very encouraging so two months later. So they're not going to go, oh, I had that quick LinkedIn chat. And how come they didn't send me something the next day? You know, I mean, they're not, they're busy, right? So that could be building a relationship. But for the most part, you're building a relationship by reaching out to them LinkedIn or on the phone. You're getting permission to send your sell sheet. And then you're sending it. And then you're asking if they're okay to receiving more um, after they reject you. And obviously not all of them will. I mean, if you contact 30 companies, maybe 28 say no and two are interested and you end up licensing to one and one falls off. It can vary tremendously. Sometimes our students will get interest from eight companies out of 30 and other times just one, but it was the right one and it's a big company. It's, it's all over the map. But I, I like your question, Gabriel. So um, you're building the relationship by sending ideas and you're doing it both phone and LinkedIn. You're missing the boat. We have a program now included with our, our boot camp called Smart Pitch. Benjamin Harrison's in charge of it. It's like a, an add-on product, um, and it's just amazing. We, he does a fantastic job at guiding people. So do our coaches and reaching out on LinkedIn as well. So now some people are so excited about not having to call that they don't do both. I think you should do both. I really do. But some of our students have success just reaching out on LinkedIn. Some are like, I hate social media, and I just want to do the phone. And uh, but to me, if you're a fully functioning inventor, product developer, licensing products, you should do both. Um, hmm. Yeah, Java. Um, I think we talked about this. Java and Saeed uh, became students recently. They reach out to me. They've been watching for quite a while this live stream. So I'm really glad that you guys became students. And Java is asking. How can I find people who, who are previously working for a company through LinkedIn? That's really easy. So you should be able to just search on LinkedIn anybody that has um, that company in their profile. And that's, a, you know, I, I can't, I don't think I've actually done that myself, but we do guide our students to do that. No, Benjamin, our smart pitch expert for uh, using LinkedIn for licensing teaches people, but you should be able to just type the company name in and there should maybe some advanced, I'm not going to jump online to do it right now, but you should be able to go into advanced and then set, do a specific type of search that will find you anybody that used to work for that particular company. So that can be beneficial. That's a good, a good thing to do. We were guiding somebody to do that just the other day. Um, Steven just did that on a deal that he closed just um, a month or so ago. And uh, he reached out to a former employee of a company. And sometimes they'll give you all sorts of great info. So that can be great. Um, let's see. Uh, Julie, if you have an idea for a product like shampoo that you can think 
can be tweaked, expanded on, and repackaged for a specific target market. Will a company consider that as a licensing idea? You know, um, if it's purely a marketing idea, I think that's going to be harder to license. Could you license it? Absolutely, you could license it. But if you're basically just saying you should market it like this and it's not a new product, it's going to be a lot harder uh, to license. Say, well, you should make the shampoo this size and then market to this market instead of this market. And you're basically becoming a marketer at that. They're mark doing the marketing jobs, the marketing department's job. Um, and it's not really an invention. Um, you know, sometimes if you took it and then you marketed it, like, let's say it's shampoo for humans, but you take it and it's great for horses. I saw there was a company a long time ago that was taking horse shampoo and marketing it to have a beautiful mane to humans. And I guess it's all the same ingredients. So it's not gross or anything like that. But um, that's going to be harder to pull off. But it is possible, Julie. Um, I, I would say... If there's something you're doing that's a different with the product as well, it would kind of put it a little over the top. You're changing the marketing, but you're also changing something about the product. Um, and sometimes changing the packaging or something like that might make sense without getting into the specifics of the invention. I can't say specifically, but generally when you're telling a company they should just market something different, the downside of it is usually you're just telling one company. Like when you're licensing something, you have a new invention, you have a new doorstop, you're probably going to reach out to 20, 30 companies. When people come up with marketing ideas, it's usually just like, oh, I want to tell that one company how they should be marketing it. And so now you're going to do all this work. And maybe they don't even want to listen to you, that one company. So you got to ask yourself the question, if I'm going to help them, if I'm going to change the way they're marketing something, it's not really an invention. Could I apply that to 10 companies, 20 companies? So when I do the work to show them what I want to show them and tell them what I want to tell them, that I can show it to 20 companies rather than one? And the answer is usually no. Usually it's an inventor. Well, that one company, they should do this. You know, so I'm not saying don't do it, but I would say most of the time when I look at those types of things, it doesn't make as much sense or it's not a good use of your time, but it could be. Um, that's the hard thing about doing these live sessions. It's we can't talk specifics. We can't disclose the invention, which is another disclaimer. Do not disclose your invention. Um, Huh. Uh, so crypto newbie. Um, hi, Andrew. My patent has been denied three times. It's now being brought before a four person panel. What do you suggest I do? Um, I can't tell you without knowing what the reasons were. You know, sometimes it's because your patent attorney is not doing a good job. I uh, didn't think things through, but um, that's not necessarily the case. One thing that shocks a lot of people is almost every time you file a patent, a full utility, we're not talking about provisionals here, every time when you file a patent, they reject all the claims. It's this game that the patent office plays, and they just reject all the claims. And they kind of what they're doing is they're kind of putting it back off onto the patent attorney to make the argument, to make the initial argument. It's just a game. And inventors will freak out about that. And I just think it's idiotic that inventors have to freak out about that. The attorney should tell the inventor ahead of time, look, more than likely they're going to reject all our claims. It's just the way it always works. Like 98% of my clients, they'll reject all the claims every time. And then the argument between the patent examiner and your patent attorney goes back and forth. Okay. So there's some sort of argument going back and forth and it's before a four person panel without the details. I can't. I can't answer your question, crypto. Um, but, uh, you know, don't leave it up to your attorney. Like, talk to the attorney. So what do they, what don't they like? And you, your attorney is not the inventor. If the, your attorney says, well, they don't like this and this. And you're like, oh, I got a fix for that. Well, we could just do it like this and this. And why don't we get this protection? So work with your attorney to talk and actively discuss it. Don't just go, oh, that's just their job. I'll put them on them. You know, that's a huge mistake. That's really do not make that mistake. Um, but without getting the specifics, I can't say because I, I, what they're objecting to, there's no way I could answer that. Um, but at least I answered it as best as I could. Uh, Saeed says, thank you. You're welcome, Saeed. Uh, Julie said, yes. 
Okay. To like it being a kind of a marketing idea. Okay. Um, Okay, La Latonia said, yeah, I did smirch purchase your smart IP PPA system and working through that now. That's great. Okay, Latonia, fantastic. Um, I'm not, 730 says, what is the best toy industry to get into? I don't know what that means. So do you mean what the best subcategory of the toy industry to get into? Um, I mean, I... I yeah, there's a lot of different when you if you look at the toy industry, there's a lot of different categories. And probably one of the hardest categories is like Ken and Barbie dolls, like the staples and things like that. And then there's other like I have some students that are working on sporting good toys, like they're they're like lawn toys or sporting goods. And it's like those are those are easier than regular um, toys. But um so I, you, if you could expand on your question, hopefully I'll get to it later. Um, yeah, Rob says, hi, Andrew, does InventRight have coaches that will take a more active role with getting students invention license for a percentage? Um, we act as if we're taking a percentage. We take no percentage. And sometimes people insist they want to give our, the coach or us a percentage. And for 20 years, We've always said no. We've never partnered with an inventor. And here's the thing. We wouldn't work any harder for you. We, we're, we've got really great coaches, and they're really good people, and they'll really tell you exactly what you need to do. Now, the reason why a lot of people want to give you a percentage or partner, what they really want to do is just put it back on us. Well, I want to, you know, I'll just, you know it's a great idea, great idea. Like, license this for me. I'll just give it to you, you know. And so... When, whenever I talk to people that insist on partnering, um, what they really want to do is just not do the work and just dump the whole thing on us. And our whole thing is about empowering you and making sure you do and say everything right so you can license products the rest of your life. So it'd be weird if we partnered with some students and not with others. Oh, why'd you partner with that guy? Oh, my idea wasn't good enough? Like we've stuck to that. And Stephen and myself have probably missed out on some incredible opportunities, but it's, a, it's an ethical issue. Um, it's about sticking to our core, um, the core of what InventRight is trying to do, which is twofold. One, to try to help you license your products, and two, to empower you with real-life experience so you can license products the rest of your life. And if we're doing that for people, you would never learn anything. If we did it all for you and we made the calls for you and we did everything for you. But it's amazing what we do do. I mean, God, when our negotiation coach Paul is guiding you through licensing deals, it's like I always explain that he's he's doing the negotiation, but you're the mouthpiece. He's telling you how to reply to an email, what to say on the next phone call. It's like he's doing it, but you're the mouthpiece, and you feel it, you experience because he won't be on the call with you, he won't reply to the email for you, but he'll tell you exactly what to say to reply to the email. He'll tell you exactly what to say on the next phone call. And so that we just stick to our guns with um, empowering people. If we do it for you, we don't want to empower you at all. Um, so Rob, the answer is we would be helping you as if we we're one of your partners. I think our coaches are that good and that diligent and that caring, you know, um, now you're going to do the work, but we're going to guide you. So it's an interesting question. Um, yeah, we got this last one last, we're getting a lot of these one, repeat ones, but it's a good question. I can answer it in two seconds. Sergio says, what happens after, uh, five-year licensing deal, will I still be able to receive royalties and expand the licensing agreement? But if they're smart, it'll say that they have the right to continue the agreement, providing, and usually year to year, providing they meet the same criteria, um, like minimum guarantees, they have to be selling a certain amount, performing and other performance guarantees. So if they're smart, but you'd be surprised how many students we've got the deals done where they it was completely up in the air what happened after five years, which is crazy bad for them. I have no idea. If I was a company, I would never sign that. So, and you could technically get them over the barrel at five years and they're selling like crazy and doing great and go, you know, I want to up my royalty 4%, but that's just a dick move. I'm sorry to swear, but that's just a dick move. So um, I've seen students and the students did not put the company in that position nor would you want to because they could just choose to stop selling it. So for the most part, usually they were, they, you'll be able to continue the license agreement under the same terms year to year. 
um, after three or five years usually. Um, and sometimes it's just left open. And what I would suggest is just continue under the same terms. Now, if they're not doing well and it's op left open, that gives you an opportunity to renegotiate. If they're struggling, if you've got things like you're a little upset about, they're not doing, they could be performing better here or there. So it gives you a little leverage. Um, so that's a great question, Sergio. Um, okay, Raul. Hi, Andrew. Once you get initial interest on in the product and they like, and they like to run it through their team before making a decision, what are the main factors they look at before moving forward with it? Well, that's a good question. Oh, God, a lot of stuff. So the most important stuff is can it be made? Now, anything can be made at a price. But so more importantly, can it be made at a reasonable price? Um, they're going to look at all the other products on the market, which they're probably already pretty familiar with. Is this going to give us a slight leg up here or there? You know, like there's some somewhat similar products out there. And if yours, if theirs is on the shelf next to this other similar product, would a fair percentage of people buy your product over their product. So they're going to think these things. Um, marketing is going to look at it and go, do we have good marketing points here? Do we have good sales points where people are going to look at the marketing and go, yeah, um, can it be made? Can it be made in a reasonable price? Um, is it how much is going to investment is going to be in order to make it? Do they need a $200,000 machine or is it a sewn product? And it's going to cost them next to nothing to get up and running because it can be sewn by hand. You know, what are the, what are any tooling costs? Um, does it have enough of a benefit? Sometimes just a little benefits enough. Sometimes in some categories, it got to have a little bit more. Um, so uh, does it have that, that benefit? Does it have that wow factor? It could be a slight change um, or it could be a wow, but does it have something extra? It's got to have something extra, right? So that's what they're going to look at. And sometimes the marketing and sales and the owners and everybody will get together and they'll, they'll take a, a look at it and they'll all give their opinion. And they're all talking about that sort of thing. Um, so you should have, make sure that they have what they need. Ask them who's going to be in that meeting. How does that work? And our negotiation coach is always guiding our students on making sure that the, they have the right materials. A lot of times the inventors won't, won't interview the company about how, how do your meetings work there? Who's going to be in it? What do you need? Um, and if what you sense a little weak, maybe you need to give them something extra. You know, it's going to be really clear. But usually the sell sheet or the, the, the video sell sheet is going to be enough. Maybe your champion in the company likes it. They get it. But they struggle a little bit understand it, but now they do. So maybe there's something that needs to be fixed or maybe do additional video explaining something that they want to show. So ask them what they need. Um, oh, there's a similar question, different person. But Zam says, when you get interest, would a company want additional marketing materials even after you've sent a sell sheet? Um, usually not required. Usually if you did a good job, that's going to be enough. But they might. But usually, usually not. Um, they might want something sometimes... They maybe the sell sheet, maybe you do an additional video showing, you know, like some boring instructional video, like, okay, guys, here's how it works, and do this and do that. And you make a video and you show a working prototype and they want something like that. But usually they're not going to need that much more in the way of marketing because we are so insistent that, well, I should clarify that because you guys aren't students. So, Zam, what I would say is when our students do such a great job with the sell sheet, that you should be good because we are really obsessive about having a great marketing piece. Now, if you're doing it on your own and despite your marketing piece not being great, the marketing manager took the time to look through it and go, oh, I kind of get this. I get it. And they talk to you and they're like, I fully get it now. In that case, would it be good to go back and fix it up before they show it to the rest of their team? Absolutely. So I, I was going to give an answer. And then I said, wait a minute, okay, if you're not an event rights student, you might not have a great sell sheet because most of the inventors that we talk to that aren't event rights students, we've had a few contests and things where people would send us sell sheets. 95% um, of them were not good enough. Um, and some of them were just terrible, like terrible, terrible. Like, oh, my God, I want to throw up terrible. 
And then other ones are like, eh, okay, but you're making them work. And then some of them, some of them are like, oh, pretty good. But with a few extra tweaks, it could be a little, quite a bit better. Um, and then occasionally I'll get one that's like, wow, this is really good. Like, you know, I make a little tweak or maybe nothing, but that's rare. That's maybe 5% of the non invent right student sell sheets that I see. So in that case, Sam, would you want to fix those up and get them, make sure they got the marketing straight and they understand it? Yeah, absolutely you would. Um, Roy, how, how about a health protocol solution slash method? How do you patent a consultation methods? So there is something called a, a, biz, a method of doing business patent or a process patent. Some, you know, they're, they're, they're just utility patents, but this is the way intellectual property or patent attorneys will, will describe them. Um, so, you know, like you do this and you do this and you do this. You could do that for painting a house or some sort of process. Um, you know, so Roy, that, that might be possible to get a patent on that. Obviously, I can't say yes or no because I haven't seen the product. And even patent attorneys can't tell you for sure if you'll get a patent or not. Um, but it's a health protocol or solution. You know, sometimes when you have these solutions and you have these methods, you know, and then there's there might be a product that's involved as well that can be beneficial. Um, but it's kind of hard, like, if you have this health protocol and it's something that nurses are going to be doing, it, it's kind of hard to get protection on that. But um, if it involves a physical product as well and you're wrapping it all together, it can be a little bit uh, more solid. So, again, without seeing the invention, I can't say specifically, but it's possible that you could license a health protocol solution method um, consultation method that is possible. You got to kind of figure out how practical would it be? Think about the people that are using it and could you really prevent other people from using it? And um, maybe there's a, a manual that's included or something, um, but it's possible, but I can't say specifically for since I don't know what your idea is. Um, let's see. Um, Okay, uh, Randy says, uh, do you have any idea what the best state to set up an LLC is and if, if I'm a U.S. citizen living in Europe? Um, I would say one of the states that are the, the cheapest and offer the best uh, measure of protection. A lot of people talk about Nevada where I live or Delaware or those types of states, but you really need to talk to your tax advisor, Randy, and figure out what you want to do there. If you're living in, even though you're living in Europe, you probably have a res, I don't know if you have a res, if you have, I don't know, I've never lived overseas and done my U.S. taxes. I don't know if you have to claim a state as your home state. I would think you have to. I don't know how that works. It's interesting. So, um, yeah, but again, that's something that you could just do when you're in the midst of a deal, you know, and not do it now and wait. So, uh another uh attendee said nevada is a good one to do and in, in, yeah i agree i'm in nevada I, I agree um robert says andrew's the man thank you robert <laughs> i'm the man um uh, saeed said thank you we enjoyed meeting with you thank you so much saeed and, and uh java uh became students so um uh Keaton says, hi there, what are the steps to learn the manufacturing process and should I decide uh, the materials of the product or just do a 3D model is enough? Use common sense. You know, I mean, if you, the types of products that you're doing are typically plastic or typically metal, it's probably going to be plastic or metal, depending on what your research is. Look at other products in that space and then figure out what your product would would be made out of, you know, and a lot of that's pretty going to be pretty obvious in most situations. Um, and so as far as learning the manufacturing process, like we had this student and she had um, a new invention for toilet paper and this toilet paper was going to offer a certain benefit. And it, actually, Stephen had talked to her. This is a while back, a long time ago, and, and said, you know, I'm not sure that that can be done. Sorry about the noise. So he said, I'm not sure that that could be done. And so he said, why don't you go on YouTube and watch videos, which there are a ton, how is toilet paper made? And after watching that video, she came back. She's like, oh, I don't think we can do this. Stephen and I watched the video. 
And we were like, yeah, I don't think we can do this based on how that machinery works. So you'd be surprised what you can find on YouTube and elsewhere to learn how things are made. But most of the time, that's not necessary. You can just look at similar products and go, well, it's just like that thing that's 1995, but I put a hinge on it. And I know they can make that for 1995. So that's all I'm done. You know, so a lot of times you don't need to do manufacturing research. You just make assumptions based on what else is out there. Um, so, but you should have an idea, Keaton. Use your common sense. Should it be plastic, metal? Should pieces be out of this or that? Um, and if a big part of what you've invented is already being done and you're just adding a hinge, for example, you don't need to understand all the manufacturing because you know that could be done. It's already there. It's in another product. But I'm just changing this. You should understand your change, if that makes sense. Um, whenever I explain like that to people, it really is like, wow, okay, I, I was overwhelmed. Now I'm not. I can I can look at that. Um, uh, fresh, fresh, fresh said smart pitch is down. I don't know what that means. Um, our website's not down. It's in our website. So. Not sure. Maybe you can clarify what you mean by that. Um, so Jeff said, Benjamin gave us a little spiel. For example, it's probably not your department, dot, 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 to break the ice. After that, say, yes, they say, yes, send it to me. So, yeah, you know, that is one of the things we teach. It's probably not your department, even though you're pretty sure this marketing manager is the right person. But what, can you direct me to the right person? that would receive ideas for licensing or something like that. Um, and so then, then they say, oh, yes, send it to me. So they like that you're not making assumptions, and they can pass the buck and give you to someone else if they want to as well. Um, yeah, so that's a thank you, Jeff, for sharing that. Jeff, you must be an InventRight student. So. Um, so uh, Miner says, what... What's up? I love you guys. Things are getting better with the coronavirus. Please do something like an expo, outdoor expo. That way inventors can get together and that way we can network, please. Yeah, you know, we, we were actually looking at these, doing some sort of conference this year with corona. Of course, that's completely not going to happen. Um, where we'd invite past event rights students, current event rights students, um, fans, and we would do a big conference, maybe invite some companies. But and it would not be what I've seen before. This is a waste of time, guys. Don't go to inventor trade shows. They're a complete and utter waste of time. Unless they have some good education and speakers there, then it's fine. But, you know, you go to the trade show in the industry of your invention. If you're doing bicycles, you go to Interbike Expo. If you've got an electronic product, you go to CES. If you've got a hardware product, you go to the hardware show. If you've got a kitchen gadget, you go to the houseware show in Chicago. You go to the trade show and industry or invention, not an inventor show, not a bunch of inventors gathered together. And then there's like only two inventors with hardware products. And there's another inventor with a software product and another inventor with a gardening product. Why would any company in the right mind show up to try to license a product at that kind of show? It makes no sense. Um, so if we do an inventor show, it's going to be about education. It's going to be about networking with other inventors. And maybe we'll bring some companies that say they're looking for to license products from inventors and do something like that. Um, but it won't be a trade show because inventor trade shows an utter waste of, of time. Now, with that said, there's some inventor groups that will do that. And they got like tons of education along with it. And that's fine. And maybe it's good practice to show to other people and to pitch your product and they're charging 50 bucks for the booth or something, perfectly fine. But also you might not want to publicly disclose your invention, you know, so you got to think about that. Um, but uh, so yeah, minor, we'll, we'll consider it. We've been looking at doing some sort of in, invent right um, expo. You know, we've been around for 20 years, so I think we could get a great turnout, but right. We also looked at doing something virtual recently, but um, so that's not going to happen anytime soon with, with COVID. And, you know, it wasn't until recently that we're really kind of pushing trade shows that it can be a very effective way to hit up a lot of companies all in a day or two days. And I still believe that to be true. But before that, we were basically always 
talking down trade shows historically over 20 years. Going, guys, you don't need all that expense. You don't need the airplane flight. You don't need the hotel. You don't need all the fees. You don't need all that. You can just approach companies using LinkedIn and using the phone and do it today. You don't need to wait for a trade show. And, we've all, and we still feel that way. And that's very much true today with COVID. So don't feel like you're at a disadvantage because there's not all these trade shows happening. Um, you can just approach them LinkedIn and on the phone. But when the trade shows come back, which they will, COVID won't be around forever, it can be a very efficient way of, of reaching out to a lot of companies at the same time. And that's a whole other talk on how to work a trade show. That's a whole, we do a whole training with our students on how to do that. Um, uh, do, 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 do. So Keaton says, what happens if a patent already exists right before I have my licensing deal? So um, most of the time, it's not a problem. I mean, like, it's extremely rare that something comes about that becomes an issue. Um, so, you know, in, in the agreement, it's, you know, what I would recommend, Keaton, is that you do another search. Like, if you did a search... And then you're in the midst of a deal. Looks like it's getting closed. Go back and do another search and make sure there's no no conflicts. But most of the time, when people find other patents, when you look through the claims, it's not an issue. You know, like they see a picture. Oh my God, that's mine. But then you read through the claims, and they're protecting next to nothing. A lot of patents are weak to garbage, and so that's why you got to read through the claims. And you read it through. Like I don't know. I don't understand what this says. You, I always say when you're reading claims, read it like you have obsessive compulsive disorder. Read it four or five times. And after the fifth time you read it, you're like, oh, they're just protecting that hook. Well, that doesn't matter for what I'm doing. And you do it with the next claim, the next claim. And you realize this patent that you were threatened by is no threat to you whatsoever. And you just move on. And nine times out of ten or nine and a half times out of ten with our students, that is the case. It's pretty rare that that's an issue. Um, uh, Tangela says, what do you suggest when, when one does when your PPA lapses? So if you had to make public disclosure, showing it, selling it as swap me, putting up on YouTube, you know, not unlisted where it's private, but publicly, or putting it up on a website, if you have to make public disclosure, you can just file it again. So if you filed one and it expired a month ago, you know, you could file that exact same thing again today and get a year from today. Now, it doesn't protect you from 13 months ago if you filed it 13 months ago. But it protects you, from, you can take the exact same thing and file it again. Um, and it, even if you privately disclose it to companies, because privately disclosing it under the American Events Act is not considered public disclosure. Publicly disclosing it, but privately showing it to company for license is not considered public disclosure. So you could just file it again. But again, you know, like I talked at the top of the hour, there's no point in filing provisionals over and over if you are not going to reach out to companies shortly thereafter from filing them. But if you wanted to, you could just keep spending 70 bucks, 70 bucks, 70 bucks. You keep getting a new date. You don't get the old date. It doesn't continue the old one. But yeah, you can do that. And I've saved countless inventors eight to $10,000 because what they do is they call me and they go, oh, my, my, my provisional patent is going to expire in the next month. And my, this patent attorney told me that if I want to preserve my filing rights that I have to file within the month or I'll lose my rights. And it's partially true, but it's partially BS. So yes, you'll lose that date. You'll lose that priority date, but you will not lose your rights. You just won't be protected from that date from 11 months ago. But if you file it today, you, you still, to protect yourself with a provisional, it's not a provisional patent. It's a provisional patent application. You have to later file a patent and then reference the provisional, and you'll get protection from that provisional date. So, and, and I tell the inventor, like, well, didn't your, did you make public disclosure? What's that, Andrew? Well, did you put it up for sale? Did you show it? On? No, I haven't showed it to anybody. And I'm like, why is your attorney telling you you're going to lose your rights? They, they, they word it carefully so they make you believe you're going to lose it. Technically, if they say you're going to lose your priority date, they're right. You'll lose that date, but you can just get a new date by filing another provisional. And there are some patent attorneys to me are unethical. Now, they're not inaccurate and they don't believe, they believe you should file a patent anyway. They believe you should spend the eight or 10 grand, which we don't. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily unethical. They have a certain opinion that also happens to serve them, right? Let's just be honest. But I've saved a lot of people eight or 10 grand and 
I don't know if they told their patent attorney about me, but I bet the patent attorney is pretty pissed off at me about that. Um, or not, if they're cool, like, oh yeah, you could file that provisional again, but somebody could come up with it at the time. Never seen it happen. It could, but never seen it happen. Um, uh, Peace says, hello, Andrew and everyone. I'm in the boot camp and it's helping me a lot. Hey, great, that's fantastic. Um, okay. Okay, uh, Big Wheel says, if I feel the product I am developing may be important to national security and the military may want this before civilians do, I uh, do I apply for a PPA same as other products? Um, yeah, I would apply for a PPA same as other products. Absolutely, I would. And realize that the military would not be the one licensing it from you. A lot of people get confused. A military contractor would. The contractors that make the products that the military buy, those are your potential licensees. So yeah, I would file a PPA just like anybody else. Um, and there might be some exceptions, don't quote me on this, where they could expedite that, but get the interest from the companies first. Um, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, okay, that's a good question from Rob. Are licensing, I don't know why I asked it this way, are licensing prototypes if necessary and contract negotiation slash agreement done face-to-face -face, or is typically everything done on the phone, LinkedIn, and email? So um, yeah, I, most of our students, they never see their potential licensees. They might see them like two, threes late, two three years later at a trade show and they're like, oh, hey, Bob, hey, Sally. And they're like, hey, your product's right over here in the booth and it's been selling great and this, that sort of thing. So it's going to be done over the phone and via email. Usually if you reach out on LinkedIn, you're going to switch to email at some point. Um, and so it'll be a combination of phone and email. And it will be on average back and forth for three months. That's the average that we see our students from initial interest to sign. It can be shorter. It can be longer but it's a lot of back and forth and it's, it's not worth your time to do in person 99 times out of a hundred. I have a students insisted on it and exactly what I said was going to happen. Andrew, you were right. The right people were in the, in the room. That was a giant waste of time. I flew out there. It was a waste. So the way licensing negotiations happen, it's like a phone call, five or six emails, a phone call, four or five emails, and there's different things they need to do. And there's, um, maybe sometimes a week or two goes by before something happens. It's very, very normal. So people don't understand just because somebody shows interest, you're going to be signing two weeks later, ain't going to happen. Um, and that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Everybody's figuring out all the deal points. They're figuring out the product. They're getting some manufacturing quotes. That stuff takes time. And the marketing manager you're working with, this is not their only thing. They got a lot of other stuff going on. So they're busy, so it won't happen as fast as you want it to happen, guaranteed. Um, well, there's a related question. So Dean says, how fast have you seen a good deal, a good deal closed? I like how he qualifies a good deal. So with that said, there's always exceptions. There's always outliers. We've had a few students where it took over a year to close the deal. That's not at all normal. That's weird. Um, but we've had a few students that maybe done a deal, I think the fastest ever was, we had one that did it, it was about a week, I think. Um, but that's not at all normal, guys. I, I don't wanna set that expectation. Those are outliers, okay? We've been doing this for 20 years, so that's an outlier. But yeah, I would say I, I've, seen a, I, I've seen a week, um, but that's not normal. Um, you see, it's, everything needs to line up for that to happen. That, that never happens. Um, Uh, does the so Sergio says do the event right design studio provide video or demonstration pictures of the product? Yeah, we we do uh, 3D prototypes which get included in the cell sheets, not in videos. Um, but I think that to really benefit from the design studio, you need to be a boot camp student because the coach will help you with what the marketing is. Like our design studio right now. 
they just make it pretty. So if you give them garbage in, garbage out, if you give them terrible bullet points, terrible benefit statement, your thoughts on what the picture should be are all wrong, it's going to be a pretty piece of junk. But if a coach helps you on great, great marketing, great bullet points, benefit statement, thoughts for the, the sell sheet, oh, we should have a storyboard with three pictures here, and oh, then we'll get it right away. You know, and then they send it to Design Studio. Okay, guys, make it pretty. So I was, you know, a graphic designers are not marketing people. And marketing people are quite often not graphic designers. So you need to get the marketing down first and then get the graphic design done, whether you're doing it with us or doing it with somebody else. So, you know, so yeah, that's my take on that. Um, so I like this question. Esoteric Hayes, not your real name, I'm sure. Is, is school or college necessary or preferred for starting in the licensing game? Absolutely freaking not. You do not need to go to school to do this, but you do need to be trained to do this. You do need to be educated to do this. I mean, if you call an event right a school, then my answer is yes, because most inventors that I see that try to license their products that aren't our students are doing everything wrong, like everything wrong or a lot wrong. Now, because we do these YouTube shows and we have books and things, I see people doing a percentage of things right, a much higher percentage than the average inventor out there or fans, but it's still off. It's, I see it off frequently. It's still off. It's like, okay, yeah, you kind of went down the right path there, but wow, looking at your product, ooh, you, that's all wrong. That sell sheet's wrong. Your list of companies is wrong. You, you didn't do your research. You thought you did, but you didn't because I found in 30 seconds this and this and this, and I just off the top of my head, I can see that you need to take these things into account. Um, so... Um, yeah, so anyway, working with, so you do not need to go to college. You do not need to be a graphics person. You don't need to be a professional marketing person. You don't need to be a professional salesperson. You don't need anything, but you do need a work ethic. You need to be humble enough to take advice on what to do if you're going to be coached by us, you know. And if you're doing it on your own, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. You need to be way more patient because you'll be like, oh, you know, that didn't work. And then if you're very observant, like, oh, I, I think I see what I did wrong with this. I'm going to change this. But most, the average inventor doesn't have the ability to do that. And you need to be very patient. You need to make a bunch of mistakes, observe those mistakes, and then make the change. Not observe those mistakes, get pissed, and come to the wrong conclusion because you're like, oh, well, that's how it always is. And if, then let's say that's a particular thing, the coach would go, no, that was kind of weird. We don't see that normally. And then something else happens. They're like, oh, that's going to happen all the time. Here's how you want to handle that. So a big part of, of benefit of being a student is you learn what's normal and what's not normal. You learn what's typical and what's not typical and how to handle these things. And you get a sense of um, place. You get a sense of, of direction, you know. Um, Yeah, so uh, uh, Perspective was saying he's the, the U.S. living in Europe, and he said, yes, every, unfortunately, everything's crazy complicated as an expat, uh, particularly tax and legal issues. Yeah, that's why I can't comment about living in Europe and being an American and how you handle all that. Um, I, I was going to say, oh, it can't be that bad, but you, you're telling me you're there, and it's kind of a pain in the butt, so I believe you. Um, Okay, Dean, we ran out, oh, we're four minutes over, but um, I like this last one from Dean. If you have a product line, would you patent every different type? And if you guys want to type in what you thought of today, if you liked my help, didn't like the help, I always appreciate it. Just type something real quick before we wind up here. Um, Dean says, if you have a product line, would, your patent, would you patent every different type or just the main product? A lot of times, if they're very related, you can wrap those all into one provisional patent. If you file utilities on them, you can still cite that provisional and pull out what you need. Um, yeah, I would just get a provisional on, if they're variations, if they're really, really different products, you might file a different provisional on it. But technically, you can push the, 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 the boundaries a little bit and... Um, throw kind of somewhat different products in a provisional patent. I don't really recommend that. But then other people go the other way. They're like, oh, I've got these slight variations. Do I need a new provisional for everyone? I'm like, hell no. No, don't do that. That's a waste of money. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, you know, you have to look at the functionality, Dean, and go, what's the functionality of each product? And so anyway, with that, without, you know, getting the specifics, but hopefully that was helpful. Um, uh, Rob said, Hi, Andrew, I appreciate you taking the time to answer our questions. Very helpful. Thank you. Welcome, Rob. Uh, Dean says, thank you for the feedback. Perm B gives a thumbs up. Uh, Julie, thank you for answering my question and valuable insight. Um, and Heron, thank you for sharing. Really appreciate your insight. So, so hopefully those of you that I didn't get to your question or you didn't have a question that you still found it really helpful. Um, most people say, you know, hey, I didn't have a question, but well, those are interesting questions. And I was thinking that or wasn't thinking that even, but that was a good, good answer. Um, I like this. Jack says, I'm a newbie. Watched a dozen of your videos today. Very helpful. I got questions next time. Um, got here late. So, yeah, you know, people tell me all the time they binge watch your videos. Like, I'm talking like three, four, five hours, and then her spouse will come in and go, What are you doing? I'm watching these Invent Right guys. Invent Right guys. Who's Invent Right? You know, they're like, So, um, please do that. Take advantage of that. Stephen and I. We really feel like regardless of whether or not you become a coaching student of ours or not, uh, we do our best. We do a lot to contribute to the inventor community. And I think doing these live chats and doing all our YouTube show and okay, that's all free and our books aren't free, but they're cheap and our books and everything we do to educate inventors. Um, so we're very proud of that. Okay, cool. All right, so I want to remind everybody to take care, keep inventing. Um, I always like to remind everybody, and this might not be true for all of you, but it's probably true for most of you, inventing at some point became part of who you are. It just, for 99% of the inventors I talked to, it just happened to you one day. And you will never stop coming up with ideas more than likely. So spend the time to become empowered, to learn the business side, which is not as much fun as the inventing side. It's work, I know, but it's required to see your dreams come true and see your product in store shelves. So um, remember, it's part of who you are. It's not going to go away whether you like it or not. And you have to learn the business side. So I'm glad that Steve and myself, everybody in VentRight, all our coaches are here to help you do that. And I remind everybody to take care and keep inventing. And we'll catch up with you next time. See you guys. Bye.